Hello. So in this video, uh, we're going to aim to cover our basic limit laws. So the idea is that limits in general will be very tedious and long to do out if we had to do every single thing as a new sort of expression or brand new version of a limit. So instead, we're going to develop some laws that allow us to break limits apart into individual pieces so that we can sort of tackle those individual pieces much easier. Okay. So in doing this, uh, we're going to basically take a mostly graphical approach. So we're going to start with two just random curves of functions like these. Um, so here we have our f of x in this nice little red and our g of x in this sort of teal uh, color blue. And the idea is that we're going to see what happens when we combine these two things in various ways and how this allows us to sort of justify breaking up uh, functions. It's worth a note here uh, that these things are continuous, and so they sort of play very nicely with limits. But going forward, even stuff that isn't continuous, as long as the limit exists at the relevant point, these laws are still going to apply. So this is sort of to give us a nice intuition, but what we're actually going to be sort of developing as our rules is going to be much more general. Okay? So the first one we're going to think about is this uh, c times f of x. So c here is just any kind of real number, like 5 or 17 or pi or something like this. And the idea is that it's this constant multiple. And the question is, what does that do to the function f? Right. So if we take a function f, like this one here, um, again, this I want to stress this applies to really any kind of function. So here's another one. Uh, what does c do? So if you remember from pre-calculus, right, multiplying by constant, that's going to scale our function. So here, right, we have this uh, yellow curve is representing this c times f for some value of c. Now, it, it could do other things. Uh, for example, it could flip, right, if you remember from pre-calc, but it's, the idea is that it's this stretch factor is what's happening. And if we sort of look at the yellow line compared to the red line, you'll notice that it still is a nice sort of smooth curve. All it's really doing, as I said, is, is stretching it. It's not breaking it apart. It's not creating gaps, right? It's not creating discontinuities. It's just sort of uh, making the overall function a little bit bigger in some places, and that's really it. So there's nothing that we really need to be concerned about when we scale this thing. And, for example, um, as we can see sort of over here, right, we have this, an example point to think about. We have this f of 3, right, up, up here. And then when we multiply it by c, it goes up to here. But remember that, like, what we care about as the limit is as we come sort of from the left and from the right, are we going to the same spot? And so we can see if that's true for f of 3 down here, that's going to also be true for c times f of 3, right? Because we're still multiplying the nearby points by that same c factor. So using this, we can conclude then that the c part, right, multiplying, it actually doesn't affect the limit process. It, it affects the output, which is why we still have to have it, right? So we can pull it out of the limiting process, but we still need to have it in order to maintain equality. So what this is telling us is that we can, instead of doing the limit of a constant multiple times something, we can take the constant multiple out and still do the limit. As a note, this is actually sort of a very easy thing to miss, and so I want to draw your attention to it, which is that what we consider constant is anything that doesn't sort of depend on the variable the limit is applying. So here, the limit is as x is approaching something, so anything that doesn't have an x in it is considered constant. We think of these as like 5, 17, pi, like I said, but as we sort of move forward, we'll see that it can be other things in some contexts. So not something we have to worry about right this second, but it'll show up a little bit later. OK. So the next one, arguably one of the more sort of useful ones that we're going to be using, is this idea of the limit of a sum or difference. Um, so just in case you haven't seen it before, this symbol here, um, plus minus, right? So this is just saying sum or difference. It would be one or the other, not not both, right? But this is a way of representing that it could be either one of these. So we want to know, OK, what happens when we try to add or subtract two functions? So again, we'll start with some function, say f, another function, g. 
And we want to know, okay, if we are taking the limit of each of these things added together versus the limit of each of them individually added or subtracted together. So it would be helpful to know what the sum function looks like, right? Because this, this limit is applying to f of x plus or minus g of x as one whole unit. So we want to know what that function looks like. So that's what this yellow curve is. So this yellow curve is, in this case, adding those two functions together, the f and, and the g. Okay. But again, just like with our constant multiple, we can see that although it doesn't sort of just scale, right? The constant multiple scaled by a constant factor, not surprisingly. But nonetheless, because this f and g are sort of nicely behaved at a given point, right? So if we look at g of 3 versus f of 3, because the nearby points, right, the limit as I'm going from the left and from the right are going to that same spot, when we add the two together, the points are still going to go to the same sum, right? Because we're adding those two points together, f of 3 plus g of 3. That means that all the numbers nearby 3 are also getting added, you know, f of 2.99 plus g of 2.99. It's still going to be close by because each of those individuals is close by. So again, this is sort of telling us as a graphical intuition that these two things are going to be, uh, if, if the limit exists at that point, then adding them together is still going to exist at that point. And in particular, what this is telling us is that we can take the limit sort of independently. We can take the limit of f plus or minus the limit of g instead of only looking at the limit of f plus or minus g, right? This is sort of most commonly used when you're looking at terms, right? So if you have, for example, a polynomial like x squared plus 3x plus 5, you can split along those pluses, right? So that's where this is going to come up a lot is splitting up the terms in a given function. Okay. So next one we're going to look at is this product. The product is one where we get sort of a weird, our first sort of weird example, because you know, when, you, when you do a constant multiple, you can think of it as just stretching, right? When you do sum or difference, you can think of it as sort of stacking stuff on top of each other. But multiplying gets a little strange because there's not as easy of a graphical intuition to see what happens. So again, we're going to start with our f and g here. But it may not be immediately obvious what the product is going to look like. So here's our product, this yellow function here. And you know, if you, if you didn't sort of see that coming, that's pretty normal. It's hard to envision what a product function will look like. And in fact, I sort of want to point out here that there is a significant shift in sort of how these things play together when you are going from addition to multiplication. This is something that's going to come up as being pretty important when we talk about derivatives. So the fact that there's this fundamental shift is, is actually quite important. For now, uh, all we really want to focus on, though, is can we sort of understand what happens when we do this f times g, right? Well, how does that affect things? And again, just like before, even though the product one looks weird, we can still see that you know, nearby given problem, you know, nearby given points, as long as the f and g are sort of relatively be well behaved, the f times g is relatively well behaved. So in this example, multiplying, right, the limit of the product, we can break that apart into this product of limits, right, limit of f times limit of g. Okay, so it, it still breaks apart exactly how you would expect it to. All right, so last but not least, obvious one to check, right? And we've done addition, we've done subtraction, we've done constant multiplication, we've done sort of function multiplication. Obviously, we want to think about division. So yeah, we're back to our same f and g, right? But already something should be sort of spiking your intuition here, which is that there's going to be sort of obviously a question, or, or should say there should be a question about this representation because it's not necessarily clear whether or not this thing makes sense. So in particular, there are particular values of g that might pose a problem here. So try, for example, pausing this for like a second or two, see if you can figure out what values of g, maybe on the, on the graph down here, we might actually worry about trying to figure out a limit for. I'll give you a second or two here. Okay. so paused or not, um, hopefully, <laughs> when you were thinking about this, 
it should pop into your head, right? Whenever you see a fraction, you wanna worry about whether or not the bottom of that fraction is zero. And there are definitely places, right, where g is zero. So we have a problem over here, and we have a problem over here. So in particular, this, when we try to do a division, we're gonna run into problems at these two values because we're trying to divide by zero, that's not gonna work, right? So we have sort of, suddenly we are introducing domain restrictions where we used to have just straight up, always everywhere continuous. So this limiting question only really makes sense then if we introduce this condition that the limit of g of x has to be not zero, right? Because if it is zero, then we already can't make sense of f of x over g of x, let alone the limit at those places, okay? So our only hope, right, for this uh, quotient rule that we're trying to make here is to assume that if we're going to apply it, g of x can't be zero. So we can't apply it at these uh, vertical asymptotes over here, okay? Otherwise, you do end up with a function. And everywhere where that function, right, everywhere where it isn't the vertical asymptote, right, where we don't have to worry about this um, dividing by zero bit, the function itself is indeed uh, well-defined, right? It's, it's nice and smooth. And so that tells us then that sort of with these very noteworthy exceptions, right, where g of x is not zero, we indeed have that this splits up the way we want, that you can take the limit of the x, divide by the limit of the g, right? You can take the limits independently of the top and bottom, okay? So what do we do? So we went through and we sort of geometrically justified uh, all of these different rules. And it's sort of important to remember that it's not one of those things where you have a problem and use one rule, right? You'll use these rules many, many times in a given problem as we'll see in example videos. So the first rule we tackled, right, was the constant multiple rule. So that's saying if you have some constant, um, typically, you know, a number, 5, 17, pi, um, or if it doesn't depend on whatever the limit is uh, with respect to, meaning if it doesn't, in this case, have to do with x, that would be viewed as a constant. What I mean by that is something that we will talk about later. For now, you can just think of, you know, nice numbers. So taking that constant, we can move it in and out freely from the limit, right? We could take it out and do the limit of f, or we could put one in if that's somehow advantageous and take the limit of c times f. Uh, the next one we did was this, right, the plus or minus bit. That's just saying if you have f of x plus g of x, you can take the limit separately. If you have f of x minus g of x, you can take the limit separately. Either one is fine. Uh, the third one we did was the, the product rule, right? So this one was the first one where it was like, this seems like graphically it seems weird, but it still works. If you have the limit of a product, you can break it up and do the limit of each of them and then take the product. And finally, we have the quotient rule with the knowledge that the, uh, the quotient here, right, introduces this extra condition that you need that g of x to not be zero at the point. Otherwise, nothing is gonna sort of make sense there. So as long as the g of x isn't zero at that point, you can go ahead and do the limit independently. Okay. So that is everything that we did.